Well, it's the third Sunday night of the month, and that means it's question and answer night, where I answer questions that are submitted by the members of the congregation and occasionally visitors who drop things in the question box on their way out. I suppose they're watching online or something. Uh, But tonight's question... Tonight's question spawns a lesson I call rote prayers and spontaneous singing. Uh, The question was, what is wrong with rote prayers in light of the fact that many of the songs we sing in worship are repeated often and even memorized by many of us? Wow. Well, after much consideration, I've decided that songbooks are unscriptural and we're throwing them all away and we're just going to do spontaneous singing from now on. So that's the uh, discussion. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm kidding. That's not the way we're going to do this. Uh, we need to ask, of course, several... There, the question has several assumptions built into it in the first place, which need to be addressed in turn, which is, first of all, what are rote prayers? Well, what are we even talking about when we talk about rote prayers? And second, are they even wrong? And then thirdly, you know, well, what about songbooks? Are songbooks right? Are memorizing songs the right thing to do? Certainly we cannot allow... Our practice is not authority in and of itself. And if we look at, you know, what we do as a congregation, that's not in itself an authoritative basis for making decisions elsewhere. What the Bible says is the authoritative basis. So we need to go to the Scriptures, see if what we're doing is right, see if we can change what we're doing or tweak it or maybe just think about it a little differently even. So, we'll get to the first thing. What do we mean when we say rote? What does a rote, what does the word rote mean? Think of the word rote. What do you think of? Yeah. (laughs) Taking notes. We repeat the question for John. What is wrong with rote prayers in light of the fact that many of the songs we sing in worship are repeated often and even memorized by many of us? Now, what does the word rote mean? Okay, right. To repeat over and over and over and over again. And in case you didn't catch that, it means to repeat over and over and over and over again. Just in case we haven't gotten the definition of rote yet. We're learning the definition of rote by rote. See how that works? Right, okay. Is rote inherently bad? No. We learn by repetition, don't we? That's how. That's a very common way to learn things. When you're learning a language, you learn by repeatedly showing flashcards. They have a system now where you use spaced repetition, where they show you things, you know, progressively longer periods apart. But that's still a form of rote. You're learning stuff by repetition. You learn to play music by practicing the same piece over and over and over again. Presumably, you would get good at giving a sermon or public speaking by practicing the speech over and over and over again. I should try that sometime. Uh, And presumably, of course, uh, there's a lot of things we learn by rote. We learn by memorization. And so positively, we might think of rote as learning things by repetition. Can rote be bad? Hmm? Vain repetition. Hmm. Negatively, we might think of the, you know, the mechanical side of it, of course. Rote by, def- rote, by its very nature, tends to be something that can become very mindless, can become very... It's like you put your brain on autopilot, and then you just blurt out specific answers without thinking. Uh, and you may have this experience with people where you ask a question in a Bible class, and the answer that is given to you is not really the answer to the question that you asked, but it is an answer that is commonly repeated to many other questions. Questions because, well, they learned that by rote. That is rote repetition. I, I waited until Dennis was out of the room before I made the comment about Bible class teachers. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm not saying that about Dennis. I uh, Rote, so th- there's a mechanical side of it too. And there's a danger to rote that if we're not careful, rote can just mean we always give answers without thinking, we always say things without thinking, and thoughtlessness isn't a great way to approach God. Let's face it. All right. Vain repetition. You know, that I seem to recall reading that phrase in the Bible somewhere. Who talks about vain repetition in the Bible? Jesus. Right. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, my, ver- my version doesn't say vain repetition. It says meaningless repetition, but it's the same thing. Uh, what was that? Yeah. 
Yes, because He's God. He is powerful because He is God. So that's an example of something that is learned by rote. And that's a good thing that is learned by rote. God can do what He wants. He's powerful because He is God. Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking in verses 5 through 15 about prayer. But in particular, uh, the verses we're interested in are verses 7 and 8, which read, When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. All right. Vain repetition in prayer. What does that look like? What does it look like when people use vain repetition in prayer? Mark. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Now that is a double whammy because it's in a language you don't know, which makes it vain, and it's in a it's the same thing over and over and over, which you know also makes it vain in that sense. And <coughs> I mean, it's a pagan practice. It's something the Gentiles do because they think they will be heard for their many words. And Jesus is talking about that here. Now, that's a pretty extreme example. You know, I've never walked into a church where. I've never walked into a church of our brethren where they were just repeating the same phrase over and over and over and over in Latin. You know, you might get that in a certain masses or something like that in a Catholic mass. But even then, I think that they have a little, slightly less repetition than that. Um, so, when do, do we ever see vain repetition in our assemblies? Does that ever happen? Huh? Guide, Garden, Direct. Uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, there's a lot of phrases that we use that we've definitely learned by rote in prayer. Some people try to use vain repetition as a prohibition for like saying the same thing twice in the same prayer, or even better, saying the same thing twice in the same service. You know, we already asked for forgiveness of sins in the opening prayer. We don't need to ask for it again in the closing prayer. Excuse me, Mister Perfect. Uh, um. Well, he's stuck. Well, I mean, there was somebody that asked, what are people doing between the opening and the closing prayer? I go, well, I get distracted a lot, don't you? No, I'm distracted from my devotion to the Lord. You know, but okay, even then, can you ask for forgiveness of sins twice in the same prayer? If you mean it. Of course you can. If you can't, then Daniel's in a lot of trouble. Go read Daniel 9. He asked for forgiveness of sins like a bajillion times in one prayer. Uh, a bajillion. That's the, the real number. That you know, Patent pending. Um, Daniel 9 prays, oh, and Daniel prays over and over and over and over for forgiveness of sins. That's repetition. Oh, you know, I mean, on the other side of it, we'll talk about songs because songs are frequently prayers. Are there ever examples of songs in the Bible that just repeat the same phrase over and over and over and over and over? The book of Psalms does it a lot, hmm? Oh, yeah, yeah, in the Bible, in the Bible. Oh, yeah, we have songs, our choruses repeat themselves over and over, certainly. But, yeah, every, yeah, people are wanting to figure out what is that one psalm that he's thinking of. Psalm 136. You know? Psalm 136, if you read that song... Every other line in that song is the same phrase. For His loving kindness is everlasting. Or for steadfast love endures. Or for His uh, covenant love endures forever. However you translate it. Um, Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. For His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for His loving kindness is everlasting. To Him who alone does great wonders for His loving kindness is everlasting. To Him who made the heavens with skill for His loving kindness is everlasting. And you read on and on and on it goes. And sometimes the phrase interrupts stuff that is kind of like, um, that sentence wasn't finished yet. (laughs) There's a lot of that in Psalm 136. It's... You know, there's a lot of theories as to what's going on here. The most popular of which is that, you know, the song leader would sing a line and the congregation would sing the refrain, His loving kindness is everlasting. Um, But is that vain repetition? Can we pray that in church? Hmm? 
It's scriptural. <laughs> it's actually, yeah, yeah, there you go. Is is there a difference between meaning less repetition and meaning full repetition? Yes, yes there is. What's the difference? <gasps> it has nothing. It has more to do with what you is going on in here than what's coming out of here. Right. Uh, motive is the the basis for meaningless repetition. And in fact, if we pay attention to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus makes that point very clearly. Matthew 6 and verse 7, don't use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Why are they using meaningless repetition? What does it say in Matthew 6? They think they will be heard because of their many words. They think if they say it enough times, God will hear them. It's like, if I perform the ritual enough, then God will bless me. If I say the prayer enough times, then God will finally listen to what I'm saying. You know, God wasn't going to answer your prayer on the 999th time you prayed it, but on the 1,000th time you prayed it, well, that's the magic number where God gives you what you want. God answered the prayer. It's kind of like, it's kind of like spamming the prayer. You, know, you just spam the prayer over and over. It's kind of like you know when Jenna wants to order clothes online and the website's being all wacky. You just spam the, the purchase button until it finally goes through. Now, that's what some people think prayer is like. If we just spam it enough times, eventually it'll have a result. But, of course, there's not a lot of faith in the whole practice in the first place. Um, Jenna, do you have your hand up? Somebody had their hand up and I missed it. Oh, John had his hand up. That's what it was. Okay. Well, you remember what it is later, huh? (laughs) All right. Yeah, well, he, he, actually, it's backwards from that. We, have, we sinned, so Jesus died for our sins, and then he rose from the dead. Oh. Okay, so, you know, you know, this idea, you know, God won't, the idea that God won't hear you unless you say it over and over is incorrect, and that's Jesus' criticism here. It, yes. Well, yeah, the God, no, you, you should pray persistently. Is the reason you should pray persistently because God isn't hearing you until the nth time? No, that's. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. The point of prayer isn't to tell God something he doesn't already know. The point of prayer isn't to educate God. The point of prayer isn't to teach God by rote. <laughs> Some people think that that's what it is. You're not supposed to teach God by rote. You know, He educates you by rote. It's the other way around. It, it, it's not like God is our pupil. It, he knows what you need before you ask. Jesus says that in verse 8. Yes, Jen? Nag the judge. And... Right, it's an argument from the lesser to the greater. The unrighteous judge, and this is Luke 18, I think we're referring to here. Uh, in Luke 18... There's a parable, they ought to pray at all times and not lose heart. There's a judge, he didn't fear God, he was a godless judge. The widow comes, she wants protection, the judge doesn't want to do it. Eventually, the judge caves because he says, if this widow doesn't stop bothering me, I'm going to get worn out, so I will give her legal protection from her adversary. His point, in verses 6-8 through of Luke 18, is, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for His elect who cry to Him day and night, and will He delay long over them? I tell you that He will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? The whole point of that parable isn't to say, you know, God's not going to hear you unless you pray a lot. He's saying that you need to pray so as not to lose heart. Will He find faith on the earth? Will He find people that trusted Him? Will He find people that called out to Him in prayer? Uh, you know, that's the, that's the main lesson that we need to get in this. Now, out of all the prayers that are rote prayers, probably the most common rote prayer in the entire world comes from a passage immediately after Jesus says, don't use vain repetition. And that is, of course, uh, his statement in verses 9-13 through 13 of Matthew 6. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, which hallowed is a big fancy word meaning holy. 
uh, don't know why they translate it hallowed here and holy everywhere else. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, and some versions add, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then he makes an ongoing comment, if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Which, even that statement, you know, whether or not God listens to your prayer for forgiveness has more to do with who you are outside of the prayer than it does with how many times you say the prayer for forgiveness. You know, begging God for forgiveness. Yes, people have this... I guess they think salvation is like this game of Russian roulette where they constantly fluctuate between this state of saved and not saved until they ask God for a chance to forgive them. You know, whether or not God forgives you has a lot less to do with your timing and asking for forgiveness and a lot more to do with who you are as a person in relation to God and whether or not you're walking in the light as He is in the light. Whether or not you are practicing these kinds of things, forgiving others and so on. If you don't forgive others, your Father's not going to forgive you. It doesn't matter how many times you ask for it. Um, now, is there, I mean, anything wrong with the model prayer in verses 9 through 13? Anything wrong with praying that? No. There's so, so much enthusiasm over that prayer. Is there anything wrong with getting up and praying verses 9 through 13 in the assembly? No. Not at all. That's how Jesus told his disciples to pray, right? I mean, you know, it's a. The problem arises when the prayer is thoughtless. And I, I, you know, I've been in assemblies before, and other people can describe similar situations. Where you know, okay, everybody stand up, and we're all going to recite the Lord's prayer together. And we recite it, and it's funny we don't recite it the way it's written. We recite it with some very strange inflections. Our Father who art in heaven, how will be thy name? You know, it's it's very awkward, and you know, it's it, it, the problem arises when the prayer is thoughtless. When we're not thinking about what we're doing. We're not thinking about what we're praying. Our brains are on autopilot. And the wrong application to get from this text is, oh, well, I can just repeat the Lord's Prayer over and over and over and over until God blesses me. The model prayer that Jesus gave. The perfect prayer. Why would I need any other prayer? I don't know. I don't think it took Jesus all night to pray that in Luke 6.12 when He spends all night praying. Uh, But... Number one thing, by the way, number one thing on the list of things that are not told in the Bible that I wish were is what was Jesus praying in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12 when He was spent all night praying. That is the one conversation that I want to be a fly on the wall for more than anything else. Even though He was outdoors and there probably weren't any walls. Uh, No figure. Um, Thoughtlessness is not how we approach God. It is never a way to approach God. Because in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, we are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And if we approach God thoughtlessly, we are not loving Him with all our mind. Jesus said that was the greatest of the commandments. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22. I didn't catch that. No, He doesn't. That's true. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. This is, yes. Well, questions are usually submitted beforehand, but you know, it's good to bring up discussion. It's always good to have reminders of those kinds of things. Now, we talk about prayers. Sometimes whole prayers can be wrote. Sometimes just individual phrases in prayers can be wrote, like you know, guide, guard, and direct us, or uh, give the preacher a ready recollection. That one's always funny when you're the preacher to hear, you know, that because people pray for the preacher to have a ready recollection, you should be praying that my tablet doesn't malfunction and my notes get lost. Because that'll, that, then I really won't have a ready recollection. Well, th- then I'll need that ready recollection right then. Um, I mean, you know, 
We use the phrase, the only time in my entire life I've ever heard anyone use the phrase, everlastingly too late, is in a prayer in church. Um, that's just, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty common, and there's a lot of phrases like this. We use phrases in prayer that we would never use in ordinary conversation. Well, I mean, well, you're talking to God, so of course it's different. Oh, well, yeah. Um, sometimes we, uh, you know, I don't want to get into the, this too deep, but, you know, there's also the discussion, often grammatically inconsistent use of thee and thou in prayer. Uh, now, people can use thee and thou in their prayers if they really want to. You know, I don't have a problem with that. Um, we do it all the time in our songs. Uh, but let's not fool ourselves into thinking that because we use an archaic second person pronoun to talk to God, that that somehow makes us more holy. It doesn't. It's purely a linguistic quirk that quirk that's for our emotional benefit if we choose to invoke it. I don't choose to invoke it. Um, I don't think the apostles would have understood it at all because, well, they didn't speak Elizabethan English. Uh, but there you go. That's life. And, you know, it's not something to hold people in contempt for if they do it, and it's not something to push on other people if they don't do it. Um, you know, but saying thee and thou does not make a man more holy. It's just a thing people do in prayer sometimes. The point is, thoughtlessness is not an option when it comes to approaching God in prayer. Thoughtlessness is also not an option when it comes to approaching God in song or when it comes to approaching God in anything. Let me ask you a question. What about Scripture? Can the recitation of Scriptures be vain repetition? Sure. Absolutely. Proverbs 26 and verse 7 says, Like a lame man's legs which hang useless is a proverb in the mouth of fools. You know, can somebody quote a proverb, quote a scripture, and it be like a lame, a lame man's useless legs? Yeah, scripture can be that way if it's used incorrectly, if it's used thoughtlessly. Is everybody who quotes scripture automatically right? No. How do you know that? Misapplication, no application? Satan quoted Psalm 91, didn't he? I mean, Satan quoted the Bible. Was he right when he did that? Oh, the Lord, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. The Lord said in Psalm 91 that his angel, he would send his angels, bear you up. He quotes the psalm. He stops just short of the part where it talks about treading on serpents, but that's, yeah, he probably was a little uncomfortable about that passage. Um, and if you had been a good kid growing up and you'd done your memory verse work and you memorized Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12, but you didn't learn anything about the context, well, Satan might have had his way with you in that instance. Are memory verses bad things? No, memory verses are good things. But memory verses need to come with an understanding of the context. Um, otherwise, well, memory verses too can be just vain repetition. Just uh, You learned it by rote, but you have no idea what it means. Um, and I was talking to my dad just this weekend, actually, and you know, he's teaching a uh, like a first grade, a second grade class at church right now. He and my mom are teaching it together. He says, yeah, we do, vim- we do memory verses. You know what we do with our memory verses? We make them explain the story it's in. We make them explain the context it appears in. <gasps> Some people freak out. That's too much work for a first and second grader. He says, first and second graders will surprise you. First and second graders will surprise you. He says he's heard some amazing things in that class. Makes the kids explain the context and the story it appears in. Are they learning by rote? Yeah, but they're learning meaning behind it. They're learning to think. That's beneficial for them. You know, I mean, otherwise, you know, you can hear, you, you can quote, faith comes by hearing a million times and not really have an idea of what in the world that passage in Romans 10 is talking about. Um, what about rote singing? Okay. When do we engage in rote singing? Now, we have a problem because, you know, we, we tend to hear the same phrases over and over in prayer. We think, oh, pff, that's just mindlessly repeating verbatim what we've heard before. But see, the thing is that we sort of do that all the time. Every time we sing a song, we repeat phrases we've heard before and learned before. And if we sing songs over and over, we'll memorize them subconsciously. They affect the way, and so much so they affect the way you read Scripture. You know, I know whom I have believed is not, believe it is not pronounced believe it. It's pronounced believed. But we say, I know whom I have believed because there's a song that taught us to say it that way. It's a good song. But it had that effect on our thinking. That's how powerful songs are. They change the way we pronounce very obvious words. 
I mean, and sometimes we memorize songs and we have no clue what they mean. I, I can tell you right now, I have lines of Telugu songs memorized and I have no idea what they are saying. Or I have a very cloudy idea of what they are saying. Um, you know, I mean, there's a song, I, I caught myself humming it the other day, Jarigeni Nichitame, and I think it means something, you know, the Lord's will be done, but that's not exact an exact translation. So, um, I'm kind of, what does that mean? Um, probably should go back and learn. So what makes the difference between bad singing and good singing? Hmm? Singing with meaning, singing with the heart, singing with thoughtfulness. Good singing is a singing that provokes our minds, forces us to better comprehend the glory of the Almighty, better express the glory of the Almighty. That's a challenge. And so, I mean, because we sing songs over and over, and because we have them memorized, how do we avoid them becoming vainly repetitious? How do we avoid just, you know, after the 16th iteration of Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, how do we avoid that becoming vain repetition? I like that song. It's a good song. You know, but I'll admit, sometimes I sing it and I'm not really thinking too closely about it. And sometimes I sing it and I am thinking about it. How do we avoid making it thoughtless? Mm-hmm. Conscious effort? No. Yeah. I mean, you know, of course, you know, one strategy is to you know, just constantly be learning new songs, uh, which some people don't like that very much, and that, that's difficult. You know, but we have a lot of un. I mean, even the book we have now, I don't think we've even got the majority of. We haven't even learned the majority of what's in this book so far. So there's certainly always more material to fall back on. Um, most people don't see people. People have this aversion to learning new songs. Most people don't know all their old songs. Uh, that you know, it was written a thousand years ago, but oh, I haven't learned that yet. Um, you know, because. So the fact of the matter is, is if you sing the exact same five songs every single week, uh, it's going to be harder and harder not for that, for that to not be vain repetition. There's a challenge there that needs to be met. Uh, so I think I personally, and this is you know Wayne's opinion and not Scripture, uh, personally think it's important that congregations always be learning new songs. Even then, you know, some songs are better equipped to provoke thought than others. Uh, you know, I'm... <laughs> I'm far more provoked by no guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, than I am by the phrase, I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again. That's just a, There's just something about one of them seems like there was more thought put into it than the other. Uh, but at the end of the day, of course, songbooks were not written by inspired men. They were written by uninspired men. Because sometimes the thought isn't that good, and you know sometimes people will rush to defend it anyway. And you know, well, we just need to be careful. We need to scrutinize. You know, I liken songs to you know offering sac- offering animal sacrifices. Sometimes you know, we don't offer the lame or the blind for sacrifice. We shouldn't take lame hymns or blind hymns and offer them to the Lord and say, "Oh, this is acceptable worship." It's like, did you think through that before you gave that to me? Yeah. What's the thought that counts, God? I know. Were you thinking? Um, those are things to just kind of consider. Ultimately, of course, it can be the best song in the world. It can be straight out of the Bible. It can be a psalm. But if you sing it thoughtlessly, it's still vain repetition. It's just vain worship in that instance. And so Psalm 136, repetitious as it is, can be a very thoughtful song. Or it could be a very vain repetition, depending on the mindset of the worshiper who sings it. But I mean, in this way, of course, you know, we see that the question really kind of hits on this um, a much deeper idea, which is that you're not supposed to approach God thoughtlessly, whether it be by rote prayers or rote singing or rote teaching. Do we ever have vain repetition in our teaching? Hmm? Yeah? I mean, you know, and there's a lot of stuff that brethren will say. And there's nothing wrong with what they say in and of itself. But it's like, you know, the five point plan of salvation. Hear, believe, confess, repent, confess, be baptized. I got it. 
or something out order there. The five acts of the assembly, singing, praying, teaching, giving, the Lord's Supper. The problem is not believing those formulas. The problem is that if you think those formulas sum up your relationship with God and, oh, this is, this is all I need to do right here. Well, if that's your relationship with the Lord, defined in ten seconds, you need to go back to the Scriptures a little bit. And you need to dig a little bit more. Uh, the problem is that, and you know, there's nothing wrong with those formulas. The problem is that, of course, they have many times turned into vain repetition. And you have, I have met brethren who say, well, that's the only way to preach. Every sermon must contain the five point plan of salvation. They wouldn't like me very much. <sighs> well, because, no, the truth is that I'm not going to repeat the same thing over and over and over at the end of every lesson and just expect people to go with it. No, that's not how it is. We want to provoke thought. We don't want to go on autopilot at the end of a lesson. We don't want to go on autopilot at, in the middle or the beginning of a lesson when we're teaching the Gospel. We want to be thinking about the Gospel. We want to be loving God with all of our heart and soul and mind. And so in that sense, it's important to you know, constantly be thinking of new ways to express our devotion to the Lord, new ways to express the truth of His Gospel, digging through the Scriptures to find, you know, or more to the point, some folks say, you're trying to find something new in the Bible. I say, well, I don't think you all found all the old stuff yet. <clears throat> I don't think I have. Goodness gracious, we could dig through the Scriptures for a lifetime and not find it all. And life's too short for vain repetition in that instance. I want to talk also about another kind of related subject, and that is this relationship between singing and prayer. Now, now are singing and prayer 100% distinct from each other? They're not at all the same. You can't have a... There, there was a there's a song, uh, an e- it's called an evening prayer, you know, and it ends with the phrase, in Jesus' name. <gasps> Do we have this mystery sixth act of worship that's the combo hybrid song prayer? Is that what that is? Well, I mean, therein lies the problem of a five-part formula is because it trains us to think in uh, arbitrary categories. Well, no, the truth is that what, what is singing? What is singing doing most of the time? List things that singing does. Praises God. Edifies one another. It's basically what you got. You basically hit it. Yes, Jen? Teaching, which would fall in the category of edifying one another, I'd say, yes. Um, you know, you're either praying to God, or you're praising God, or you're saying something to God, or you're saying something to your brethren as a teaching tool. Sometimes you're doing both, by the way. You can teach people while still talking to God. I mean, otherwise, why are there so many prayers in the Bible to teach us? Why did Jesus teach his disciples how to pray? Yes, Jen? Yeah, that's true. John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus. He said he, he thanks God that God has always heard him. He says, I know that you always hear me, but I'm saying it for the benefit of those around me. I know some brethren would get, their, they would get really tied up in knots over that. Oh, you can't teach people in prayer. You can't preach a sermon in prayer. Well, Jesus did it. Well, it's different. No, that's actually we're supposed to imitate Jesus in prayer. <laughs> Sometimes you are supposed to use prayer as a teaching tool. But singing and praying aren't as distinct as you know our tradition might suggest. Um, you know, you read Habakkuk chapter three. Habakkuk chapter three says this is a prayer of Habakkuk in Habakkuk three verse one. And you get to the end of the chapter and it says it's for string instruments. Well, which is it? Is it a prayer or a song? Well, it's both in the Bible. And the truth is that a lot of our songs are just scripted prayers or scripted admonitions, or scriptures outright, which is kind of the ultimate script. So, I mean, what we call our song service, well, is a lot of prayer. And what we call the opening prayer and the closing prayer is really just more spontaneous prayer that isn't scripted. That's the main difference. You know, we have... It's like, okay, and today our brother will be leading the prayers, and then afterwards our brother will have an unscripted prayer, and we would be saying that, and that would be technically true of what we do in this assembly. Tradition influences how we think about things. Uh, you know, we chose at most assemblies that I know of choose to sing their scripted prayers as a group and say their unscripted prayers as individuals. 
Um, but you could reverse that, and there technically wouldn't be anything wrong with it. Uh, would there be anything wrong with somebody... For instance, would there be anything wrong with a brother writing out his prayer, and when he's called on to lead the opening prayer, going up to the podium, and that's what he prays. He reads that prayer off of his script. Is there anything wrong with that? Hmm? No? I've done that before. <gasps> no. No, there would be nothing wrong with that. Would there be anything wrong if we wrote out a prayer and just recited it all together as a congregation? No, nothing wrong with that. There's no scripture against that. That's just a tradition. In fact, we already do that. We just set it to music. Um, it, hmm? Yeah. Yes, yes. You know... Would there be any, I mean, you could pull out the songbook and collectively read the words in the songbook, you know, as a prayer, and there would be nothing wrong with that. And all of these are, are these are matters of these aren't matters of function. Uh, you know, they're not tampering with the worship of God. They're just playing with the tradition, the form, and they might differ from traditions you've been exposed to. But tradition's not authority. All right. Well, if it causes somebody to stumble, and you know, there's the issue, be forcing people into a situation where they do have to do something they believe is sinful, that's always so difficult. What about spontaneous singing. People come. People sometimes ask about that. That's kind of the opposite issue. What's wrong with rote prayers? What's wrong with spontaneous singing? We already have spontaneous prayer in a way. We have unscripted prayer. Uh, you know. So, I mean, there's very simple, basic questions. Is there anything wrong with singing a song that's not in our book? No. Indecency in order, that's true. Of course, even with that, what defines decency? Yes, Jen, you have something. No, the first one. But it's impre- if you can make up a song as you go, that's impressive. Uh, I don't know very many people that can do that. <laughs> I mean, I do it sometimes, but it's, but it's never good. <laughs> and it would be hard to follow that. That's the thing. Um, you know, but okay. I mean, you know, you can sing a song that's not written in the book. We've done that before. You can start a song without announcing the number, which would be impossible anyway if it's not in the book. You know, the song leader doesn't have to stand up in front of the congregation in order to lead the song. We've seen instances of that even here. Uh, so, you know, I mean, no. You know, I mean, if I were to start a song in the middle of this sermon and, you know, just say, okay, everybody join in, there would be nothing wrong with that either. Because, you know, it's again, it would be part of the order here. Decency in an order is, you know, about not... It, when 1 Corinthians 14 talks about not doing everything decently in an order, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting against this notion of, you know, just constantly clamoring over each other. You know, what that passage does not mean is that we have to have a list of every single word, every single thing, every single idea that is going to be expressed in our worship service before it begins. Well, that's not what decency in an order means. That might mean that for some people in some cultures, but it's not what Paul meant when he wrote it. Uh, So then the flip side, of course... Common Book of Prayer. Anybody ever seen that before? The Common Book of Prayer? Some, some denominational churches have that. Is, that. is that practice wrong in and of itself? No. No, it's not wrong in and of itself. I've heard brethren outright condemn it, but because, you know... I guess, you know, your enemy can't... When your enemy... Well, your enemy, you're always going to criticize how he holds his spoon, even if it's perfect, I guess... If you say that common book of prayer is wrong, well, you've got to get rid of this because i got news for you. This is a common book of prayer. It's, we call it a song book or a hymnal, but if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then you know, it's a duck. And if it is... I mean, because that's basically what it is. Every congregation has a common book of prayer. Now, I know some people, they've gone to the opposite extreme and they've said, well, having a songbook is a sin because we say common, common book of prayer is a sin and they use this to advance their whole we should only sing the Psalms agenda. But that's a subject for another Q&A. Yeah, I know. The Psalms are a common book of prayer too, right? Um, 
But the truth is, it's like Paul said in Romans 2 verse 1, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges from passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Uh, so, I mean, the fact is there's no scriptural basis for condemning a collection of songs from which we will draw from for worship because the book of Psalms gives us precedent for that. It is a collection of psalms. It is not the only collection of songs that Israel ever had because you can clearly find other examples of songs that Israel used in worship throughout the Old Testament like Deuteronomy 32 and Exodus 15 and Judges chapter 5. You know, but it is nonetheless an example of a collection of songs that people would draw on for worship. So there's nothing wrong with that. There'd be nothing wrong with having a book of prayer. There'd be nothing wrong with writing out a prayer and presenting it to the congregation, having them recite it. There'd be nothing wrong with writing out your prayer beforehand. Uh, so to answer the main question, to repeat the main question by rote, what is wrong with rote prayers in light of the fact that many of the songs we sing in worship are repeated often and even memorized by many of us? The answer is nothing is wrong with rote prayers unless we mean by rote that we are saying them thoughtlessly and not giving any real consideration to our relationship with God, which would also be true of songs and Bible verses and teaching and everything else under the sun. Nothing is wrong with memorizing and singing pre-written songs unless we use that as a tool to approach God thoughtlessly and not give any real consideration to our relationship with Him. So those are... uh, That's basically uh, the idea in a nutshell. Think when you approach the Lord. Any questions? All right. Well, I thought about talking about Halloween as well, since that question is in the box, but we'll save that for another time. Uh-huh. I waited until after Halloween to even bring that up, because, you know... <laughs> if, uh, of course, um, giving thought to our relationship with God, we need to give thought, each and every one of us personally, to how we stand with the Lord. Uh, whether or not we are in a right relationship with Him, whether or not we are walking in the light as He is in the light... Um, it's not something that we do mindlessly. We can come into this church and you know, do the rituals and check the little boxes and then go home on our merry way and think, oh, we've done everything that's required of us. Well, but the truth of it is that it, though our heart is far from the Lord, then all of that ritual is meaningless to us and it will not save us. What will save us is the God in whom we trust. Now, if you're here tonight and your trust in God has wavered in some way or perhaps you have um, forsaken Him somehow or perhaps you you need encouragement or to get back on the right track or whatever the situation might be, now is an appropriate time to let that be known while together we stand and we sing the song selected.